Good morning, Bedford United Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, come on now. How's everybody doing this morning? There we go. Friends, I don't know if you can hear the applause through the microphones online, but your, uh, your siblings in Christ have gathered here in the house this morning on this, on this day where there's so much temptation to be elsewhere. I mean, this is the most awesome weather. Um, I was joking with Gloria Churchill and Len on the way in that in Mary's Harbor, which is really northern Labrador, they had 20 degrees the other day, which is like unheard of for Labrador. So we're just in this beautiful fall time right now and enjoying it. It's great that all of you can make time to be here. If you're new joining us today, my name is Reverend Matthew Fillier, and I'm the lead minister here at Bedford United Church. And friends, you can tell that it is October at Bedford United Church. Even in the midst of a pandemic, I have a full page of announcements. <laughs> like there, there ain't no reprieve from that. We're a busy bunch. And so friends, I do want to share a couple things. One thing to remember always is that Jen knows, our administrator knows, how many of you open your weekly email. We know what the percentage is. We don't know who you are if you don't open it, but we know that the percentage of who has opened and who hasn't. And that's really important, actually, right now, is check your email. It's worth reading. It's all good news anyway. You'll feel better just by reading it. But the reason why we want to reiterate that is communication is always a struggle during the pandemic. And that's one of the prime ways we let people know about what's happening. So we have had some folks who were surprised that like, well, I didn't know that we were back to in-person worship. I didn't know that we had to socially distance in church. And so read your, read your emails. We'll keep letting you know what's going on and how it's happening. Uh, we're also saying to folks, RSVP, of course, online for worship. That really matters. If you can RSVP using the website, super helpful. And if that's difficult for you, just call the office and you can do it that way. We've made the switch to say we have yet to reach capacity as most of our, our colleagues have it in their churches. So if you want to come to church in person, feel free to register for two Sundays during the month of October. And the exciting one for that in October is the Worship and Music Committee just approved communion for next week. We are doing communion and we will do communion as if there was a food inspector on each of our shoulders. It has been well thought out about how to keep everybody safe and how to do this. So uh, for Thanksgiving, we are going to have communion, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. First time since March that we will have celebrated communion together. So a very, very exciting time indeed. All right. So a couple things to let you know about. Uh, one is that on October 15th, we will be hosting our very first faith and race conversation. Uh, we've been putting together a really cool uh, six-night series, uh, me and Megan Aston, the chair of the inclusivity team. And um, we're going to go with Zoom for that simply because we had so much interest from people who couldn't come in person. So to keep everybody equal, make sure we can reach everyone, it's going to be a Zoom event. So you can do it right from your couch with your latte, with your tea. It's all good. It'll be lovely. Uh, so just Email Jen at the office if you want to RSVP for that. And thank you for everyone who's expressed interest. Um, I got to do this one. Okay. So the harvest boxes. So we got to thank Kim Dompier and Linda Johnston for organizing this one. They are fundraising phenoms in this congregation, right? Like, like we're clapping even before. Okay. So this is what you had to do this morning for me. Uh, as Tony reminds us, right, we can't sing, uh, but you can do a drum roll. So everybody do a drum roll. I'm going to give you a total. Here it comes. Here it comes. For working with Sterling's, local Nova Scotia farmers, we raised $1,500 for Bedford United Church. Woo! Right? Thank you, everybody. That was, that was a good drum roll. We probably got some drummers out there to add to the BUC jammers that we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah. Um, friends, that went really great. We have to thank Kim and Linda for that. Thank you to everyone for participating. Uh, lots of people bought those boxes to say thank you to others or maybe to pass it along to a family who might have been struggling during the pandemic, let alone outside the pandemic circumstance. And uh, that food is, is just a glorious gift to everyone. And speaking of that, I want to remind folks that the Red Wagon is back in action, thanks to Lorraine DeLuca, who's our Beacon House rep. Beacon House is our local food bank. And the Red Wagon's right there at the office door entrance where you came in. And if you want to drop off non-perishable food items, they need them, right? Food bank use is skyrocketing around the world right now uh, throughout this pandemic. So if you want to contribute that way, 
please do. That's a lovely way to do that. And I want to remind you of some small group stuff that's going on. So Tony's got two pretty great things happening. One, choir is coming back. And two, he started a cool group called the BUC Jammers. Right? So Tony's got an offer out there for people if you play an instrument and you want to get together and jam with other people who play instruments, he would love to help facilitate you doing that. And it's uh, going to be a pretty great evening. So that's in our weekly email about how you get a hold of Tony around that. The Worship and Music Committee, or as I like to call them, Wham, um, Wham met this week and they said, hey, People are loving singing at home. It's one, of the, it's one of the downsides of being in person. If there is one, it's that one. It's we all miss singing. Well, as Carolyn Cole would tell you, she's, she, she will be singing her heart out today, right? And if you want to take a hymn book, either More, More Voices or Voices United Home with you, because you'd like to do that on your off weeks, uh, you can get a hold of the Worship and Music Committee, their email. They've got it there in the, um, in the email announcements, but how you get a hold of them. All the small groups that we've traditionally had are, are opening up and starting to get back in action and ways to get a hold of them are also in that email. So it really, you can see this theme. It's really helpful to do that. And I got to mention this one. There's two last ones to pass along quickly. This is great. Paige and the Family Ministries team, they are doing on October 9th a harvest night. So they're doing pizza in the crossing, homemade fresh pizza, and then they're carving pumpkins from 6 to 7.30 on October 9th. That sounds like a pretty great way to spend October 9th to me, I'm just saying. Uh, and if you're going to go to that, you need to RSVP um, Paige Fraser, our family ministry's lead. Here's the last one. I'm really glad because one of these folks is with us in person today, and the other one is undoubtedly online right now. And that is we issued a financial update to everybody, let folks know as of July sort of where we are as we work through our numbers. And I got to tell you, Carol McKnight, who's here today, chair of our stewardship team, and Debbie Pride, our treasurer, they have worked their tails off over this pandemic to get us in the best place we could possibly be, let alone everyone's generosity and everyone's care for the community. I like Carol, we cannot say thank you enough to you and Debbie for really handling a very complicated, very challenging situation for the church, and it's amazing. Let's have a round of applause for everyone working in the finance team. Just awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, with all that being said, I'm done. I'm going to invite Mary Eleanor to come forward and light our candles. I got a, I got a match. I got everything there. I know. The whole thing. Oh, you do. Oh, yeah, you do. Oh, that's right. Sorry. I know you do. And you said that. God is here all the time. All the time. God is here. <laughs> All are welcome. All the time. <laughs> All the time. All are welcome. Oh my. That is only a pandemic joke, right? Only a pandemic joke. Good morning. That's so funny. I actually did that one day with pasta. No lie, I put the fork in the... Oh, I forgot. Uh, I just want to make one more comment regarding choir. So I've contacted through email. We, I had Jennifer included in the weekly send out. Matt just mentioned it. So if there's anyone out there in Facebook land today that you haven't gotten an email from me and you're still a member of choir, I'm sending out a Zoom email today. So be sure to email me today so everyone can be on the same page tomorrow. We're going to begin with God of the Bible. God in the gospel. 
gospel, hope seen in Jesus, hope yet to come. You are our center, daylight or darkness, freedom or prison.
come touch us, bless our hearts. Come touch our souls that we may know and love your quiet presence, all our fears dispel. Touch and bless our souls. Come touch us in. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Listen to another parable. There was a property owner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, installed a wine press, and erected a tower. Then the owner leased it out to tenant farmers and went on a journey. When vintage time arrived, the owner sent aides to the tenants to divide the shares of the grapes. The tenants responded by seizing the aides. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. A second time, the owner sent even more aides than before, but they treated them the same way. Finally, the owner sent the family heir to them, thinking, they will respect my heir. When the vine growers saw the heir, they said to one another, here's the one who stands in the way of our having everything. With a single act of murder, we could seize the inheritance. With that, they grabbed and killed the heir outside the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to those tenants? They replied, the owner, the owner will bring that wicked crowd to a horrible death and lease the vineyard out to others, who will see it that there are grapes for the proprietor at vintage time. Jesus said to them, did you ever read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It was our God's doing, and we find it marvelous to behold. That's why I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to people who will bear its fruit. Those who fall on this stone will be dashed to pieces, and those on whom it falls will be smashed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they realized that Jesus was speaking about them. Although they sought to arrest him, they feared the crowds who regarded Jesus as a prophet. May God provide us with greater understanding of these words. May God indeed provide us greater understanding of these words through what I'm about to offer. So friends, when... Uh, well, first of all, good morning. How you doing? All right, all right, we're all tuned in. That's good. A couple of years ago, when I applied to BC and I was having a conversation with the Joint Search Committee, they asked me, they were like, so Matt, like, why do you want to come to Bedford United Church? And at least part of that answer was, 
I said to them, I, I want to serve a church that's at least as hungry as I am. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm hungry for justice. Like I'm, I'm hungry to feel the presence of God in my bones. I'm hungry for a church that isn't satisfied with maintaining the status quo. I'm hungry to be with people who want to dream new dreams. I'm hungry to be with folks who don't just think peace, hope, love, and joy are great on an advent calendar, but are actually words that lead us to the word and the way of life. Who's hungry for that? What are you hungry for? That's the question I think that the parable is really lifting up for us today. You know, Sarah Miles, she's a, an amazing church leader. Uh, she's the founder of the Food Pantry Ministry at St. Gregory of Nisa in San Francisco. Her ministry feeds 400 families every week, and the families that are fed are also the families that do the feeding. So the clients are actually the volunteers that run that food pantry for their community in San Francisco. It's an incredible, incredible ministry. And she's a great preacher and journalist. And she said, you know, the point of church isn't to get people to come to church. <laughs> it seems obvious to me, she said. The point of church is to feed people so they can go out and, you know, be Jesus. I think that is the greatest mission statement in the shortest amount of words for church. The point of church is to feed people so we can go out and, you know, be Jesus, right? That's the only reason, the first reason why we are a community is that one. But then the question becomes... What kind of Jesus are we talking about here? Y'all know there's different kinds of Jesus? There's so many different kinds of Jesus. There's like as many as there are flavors at Baskin Robbins. Like there are so many different kinds out there. We're getting bombarded by the American election cycle right now in this country. So you got to ask, like, are we talking about the Jesus who comes in riding on an ass or the Jesus who goes out riding on an elephant? Is it the leftist Jesus or the rightist Jesus agenda? Is Jesus about justifying everything I think and believe because he's made in my own image so that I'm always saved and right and someone else is always wrong and damned, right? You know, in 2006, our church, we asked each other, what kind of Jesus are we hungry for? Where is the call of Jesus in the gospel? And in a song of faith, we wrote these words. We said, Jesus knew human joy and sorrow. So filled with the Holy Spirit was he that in him People experience the presence of God among them. We sing praise to God incarnate, God in our bones. We sing, are you hungry like this Jesus? Are you hungry to announce the coming of God's reign? A commonwealth, not of domination, but of peace and justice and reconciliation. Are you hungry to heal the sick and feed those who are also hungry? Are you hungry to forgive sins and free those held captive by all manner of demonic powers? Are you hungry to cross the barriers of race and class and culture and gender? Are you hungry to preach and practice unconditional love? Love of God, love of neighbor, love of friend, and yes, love of enemy. And are you hungry to call people to love one another as you yourself have been loved? We sang that in 2006 right? What kind of Jesus are you hungry for? What are you hungry for today? And we've got to lift that question up. Whenever we hear a parable, whenever someone quotes the Bible to us, whenever someone's making a theological or a political statement about our faith, always put that lens in front of you. What kind of God do I worship? What kind of Jesus right, am I hungry for? What kind of spirit is leading my life? Because this parable today has been abhorrently destructive to our world. So for centuries, Christians interpreted this parable. They said, oh, we're the new tenants and the Jewish people. They're the ones who didn't see the light. They didn't see Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So they're going downstairs and we're all going upstairs and God loves us more than God loves them. So like they're evil and bad, right? That's the way that this parable has been interpreted for so long, right? And we forget we forget that this is a Jewish conversation happening here. Jesus is Jewish. The religious leaders are Jewish. There are no Christians. <laughs> they didn't exist. This is an insider Jewish conversation about who is faithful to God's promise and who's being unfaithful to that. That's what they're wrestling with here as Jesus gets closer to Jerusalem. You know, that story is not 2,000 years old of anti-Semitism. In Halifax this week, we have people putting stickers around the city that say Jewish people are to blame for COVID-19. 
that, that kind of thinking right, is ancient and is still with us. We've got to learn to live differently. We've we got to listen to these parables differently. We need these tools as people of faith to undo these understandings that have haunted us. Because if you read a parable and you're, you're hungry for revenge, blame, competition, dominance, and building an empire, there's nothing further from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ than those things. That is so off base, it's not in the same universe, right? Jesus reminded us, hey, when you, when you feel yourself going down the road of judgment about your neighbor, you're trying to take the splinter out of their eye, remember the log in your own. Like, judgment doesn't lead to a whole lot of good things for people. And we remember the oldest scriptures we have in the New Testament are Paul's, right? So if we want to go there for the earliest memory in our church ancestors, they said, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free. All are one in Christ. Totally different understanding. This is the kind of Jesus that we're hungry for. This is the kind of Jesus who's ushering in the kingdom of God. When we look at this parable, we've been saying as we walk through some of the most contentious parables in the last few weeks, remember, if you're going to make God the most powerful person in a parable, well, what kind of God do you worship? If you're going to make Jesus the son of the landowner in this parable, what kind of Jesus are you hungry for? seems to me that Jesus is never really overly concerned about who owns a piece of property and how much profit they're getting from that property. That's not his value system. Jesus is always concerned about who is producing the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Right? Jesus is never worried about material things. He's concerned about who's at the heart of the spiritual things in your life. So this landowner that we see that Jesus talks about doesn't follow the script of a violent, absent-minded, dominant landowner of the ancient Near East who's going to get their due. They're going to get their profit no matter how they got to get it. They'll use violence, retribution. They'll treat all their workers as expendable to get that return back. That's not the script of this parable, right? We're in an honor-shame culture. And the landowner keeps shaming the tenants, grace upon grace, offer upon offer, chance after chance to do a 180, a repentant turn in how they're living their life, to seek reconciliation. Not to go left or right, right or wrong, saved or damned, but to say there's a third way. There's a third way to go. Jesus is not about pursuing a nation-building project for a new Israel. Jesus believes building up all people is God's project, and that's called the kingdom of God to which everyone belongs. You know, Sarah Miles, she has a lovely quote about this. She said, The kingdom doesn't promise to solve or erase suffering, but to transform it, pledging that by loving one another, even through pain, we're going to find more life. And it insists that by opening ourselves to strangers, the despised or frightening or unintelligible other, we will see more and more of the holy, since without exception, all people are one body, gods. You know, the tenants, they can't believe in this third way, this kingdom of God, one body in which the tenants and the landowner can reconcile, can be together, right? Right? They can't see a way where both retribution and revenge can be transformed by grace and reconciliation. So they choose the same old script of violence and hate. God doesn't have to do any judging in this parable because it turns out human beings, we're really good at being the most judgmental judges on the planet. God doesn't need to do that because we do it every day to ourselves and to each other. The landowner doesn't have to do anything here. What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for the same old judgmental leftovers in your life? Or are you hungry for the banquet of the kingdom of heaven where everyone has a seat at God's table? You know, Jesus ends this parable in a fascinating way if you were listening to when Mary Eleanor read it. Jesus asks the religious leadership of the day, he says, so what do you think this landowner is going to do after you know, the son has been killed when he returns to the vineyard? What do you think he's going to do? But Jesus doesn't answer the question. He leaves it up to us to answer the question. The pattern of the landowner has been consistent. Grace upon grace upon grace. Why would that change now? But they believe it is going to change. 
they conclude right away. They say there'll be more violence, there'll be more bloodshed, more punishment, more dead ends, there'll be revenge. That's how this goes. If your heart is that hard after hearing all the grace, all the mercy, all the openness to a new way of living, and that's the conclusion, that heart is so stony it'll crush, crush anyone who's got that heart. Right? The good news of the gospel over and over again that Jesus has been proclaiming, even from the cross, is that God never gives up on anyone. Right? God never writes anyone off. Like This has been the entire ministry that he's been leading here. Are we hungry for the sta- same stale ends of crusty bread, the same sour wine of how people keep treating each other and how we often treat ourselves? Or are we hungry? for the bread of heaven, and the wine of which you and I will never thirst. In the heart of who you are this morning, what are you really hungry for in this life, this gift that you and I have today? What is this church, this community, this incredible, weird, and wonderful, and amazing community of people, what are we hungry for today anyway? You know, Sarah Miles, she wrote of the gospel, and I've been thinking about her so much this week, as you can tell. She said, you know, what I heard in the gospel and what I continue to hear is a voice that can crack religious and political convictions open, that advocates for the least qualified, the least official, the least likely, that upsets the established order and makes a joke of certainty. The gospel proclaims against reason that the hungry are going to be fed, that those cast down will be raised up, and that all things, including my own failures, are being made new. It offers food without exception to the worthy and unworthy, the screwed up and the pious, and then commands everyone to go and do the same. It doesn't promise to solve or erase suffering, but to transform it, pledging that by loving one another, even through the pain, we're going to find more life. And the gospel insists that by opening ourselves to strangers. Friends, God is a stranger who isn't following the same old script. God isn't serving the same old leftovers, but offering us a taste of something, someone, some world made new. And that's this life. That's this world. That's this people, this time, even in the midst of COVID-19, made new. What are you hungry for? You know, in the week that we've got till we celebrate communion both in person and at home, I want you to ask that question. When you open that harvest box we talked about, right? Ask yourself, what am I hungry for? When we gather to take the bread and the wine together online and in person, before you take each, ask yourself, what am I hungry for? When you see the California wildfires, When you see people lining up looking for work, people lining up waiting to be seen, people lining up on the front lines to be heroes and saints in the midst of what's going on in this world, when you feel the wind in your hair and the sun on your face, and when you hear that powerful ocean roar, ask yourself, what are we hungry for anyway? I hope and I trust And this was the call that I felt at Bedford United Church, that we're hungry to feed people so we can go out and, you know, be Jesus. Here's to that this week. And all the people said, amen. Now, before I turn things over to Mr. Maestro over there, Tony, I realized something. I was all fired up, right, to preach. I forgot to do something which, you know, is known to happen. And that is that there's like a whack of birthdays. And they're birthdays for people that you and I know really well. (laughs) So we better we better share those. So as we ponder what we're hungry for, I'm I'm hungry to eat some more cake, because there was a lot of cake in the office this week. Just so you know, it was our administrator Jen Johnson's birthday, right? Paige Frazier, who's our ministry, family ministries lead, it was her birthday. It was also Katie, uh, Reverend Katie Avon, our minister for congregational care, it was her birthday. So Tony and I are like. Man, we, began, we went all out. They got like a really fancy cake. They were like, we whooped it all up. So just, so just so everybody knows, we're just saying charitably now, our birthdays are in April. We're just, we're just putting that out there. Just so you know, we're, we were on the outside looking in. We want a whole week of cake. Right? We want a week of cake, at least a week of cake. We, we, between the two of us, we could eat a week of cake. So we're going to hum happy birthday. God bless you, right? 
to everybody and everyone who's celebrating a birthday this week. Got to do it. Too. And it was Jason's birthday also on Friday. Right. Anybody? Okay. Anybody else in person today? Anyone else want to be included? I'll check online here. Just give me a second. Kim Wilson. Happy birthday, Kim. Happy birthday to you. So one thing I've found since becoming the ministry music lead, music ministry lead here is Matt picks sermons that I don't find it easy to get the corresponding anthem for, <laughs> which is good because it makes me think and it makes me pray a little harder that the spirit will lead me. Um, typically I have an anthem by Wednesday. I didn't get an anthem until last evening, so I wrote one because I just in my mountain of books, couldn't find one that I thought would work with today's sermon. Because, of course, he tells the staff what the sermon is going to be about, and then I pray about it and hope it's going to be the right fit. So this morning, I'm going to sing a song that I wrote called We Are Your Church. And as I was sitting at my keyboard at home, trying to muddle together some thoughts um, and realizing what today's sermon was about, I decided to write a song that is a prayer. So even though you don't know it, the words will be up here. And I just pray this morning you'll make this your prayer. That we will have more of a hunger for God. And realize that our church uh, is not just these rounded walls, right? There are no walls to God's church. And so you'll hear that in this song. Thank you. 
Hey, everyone online is just uh, really moved right now, Tony, just so you know, you can read the comments later. Uh, but all I can say is, I mean, if I got to keep throwing you weird scriptures for you to come up with stuff like that, you're not doing yourself any favors. We're going to want you to keep writing that stuff all year long. <laughs> Tony, that was so such a gift. Thank you so much. Friends, we want to honor actually all the ways, and there are so many ways, that everyone in this community gives to make this church what it is. So let's gather together in prayer as we give thanks for all the blessings that have been provided this week. Let us pray as we are comfortable and ready to do so. Holy One, we hear your truth in the parable today. No one can own the vineyard. We receive the gift of life from you, the giver of every good thing. Who can own the wind or the beams of the sun? Who can own the waves of the ocean, the rich fields of the Annapolis Valley? Help us to share the bounty we enjoy every day with one another. And thank you, Spirit, for inspiring so many people to give of their time and their talents throughout this pandemic both across our world and in this church. People who have prayed unceasing with everything they've got because we're hungry for your kingdom come, a table where everyone has a seat of dignity and honor, where grace and compassion soften hard hearts into life abundant for all. Bless, we pray, all that we offer of ourselves, Remind us, God, we are the hands and feet of Christ. We are all welcome in this vineyard of abundant life to seek your transformation of love and justice in each choice that we make. In Jesus' name we ask it as we give you thanks and praise. And all the people said, Amen. <laughs> We are God's church, we are God's people, so let us as such come together in prayer. O oh, great mystery, source of all that is, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and with all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and celebrates each other's joys. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our hearts, our communities, and our world, we pray. While we are so grateful to live in this beautiful province, we know it's not without its problems, systemic racism being one. We lift before you the tensions between First Nations and other fishers in Yarmouth County and we pray for justice and reconciliation. 
Further afield in Quebec, we hear of the Sagi and First Nations community suffering damage to their Catholic and Baptist church buildings and the catastrophic damages to historic Wesley United Church through arson. And we lift up the congregations of these faith communities that you may bring strength and perseverance. We bring before you all those in our province, our country, and our world who have suffered so much loss through the ongoing coronavirus, death of loved ones, loss of health, loss of employment and income, the limiting of visits with loved ones in nursing homes and hospitals, and we pray for your comfort. We pray for wisdom for scientists to develop the vaccine to combat this terrible virus, as we also give thanks for our healthcare workers and all on the front lines who strive to keep us healthy and safe. Closer to home, we lift up all those on our prayer circle and in our hearts who are struggling with ill health, who are waiting test or results from test, who are in hospital, who are drawn closer to the end of their lives, those who are grieving the death of loved ones, those who are lonely, who are homeless or suffering home or food insecurity, those who are anxious and afraid, and we pray you will make your presence known to all, bringing comfort, security, and peace. On this day, Holy One, when we are in the midst of a pandemic, we still have so much for which to be thankful. Our church community, here and online, our amazing staff and all they do to keep us together during these difficult times, our families and our homes, Yet we pray you will open our hearts to see the needs of others. That you will free us from our prejudices and biases. That you will free us from being judgmental. That you will help us to see our attitudes and words, our interactions with others, do make a difference. They matter. When each of us have respect for the other, regardless of skin color, race, gender identity, sexual orientation, or creed. Our communities, our province, and our world will change for the better. Now knowing you hear us better than we speak, we offer these prayers in the name of our brother Jesus, and in your love you will answer. Amen. I'm going to get everyone to stand. And for our closing hymn, we're going to sing On This Path. And I just thought as I was looking at it, since you can only hum yet and I've been getting you to do actions and whatnot, let's make some up for this song as well. By the way, Anne, sorry about that one song. I, don't, I get so excited sometimes when I play that I go through lyrics that aren't even on the page. So, or I mix up verses, whatever. So anyway, for this first part, On This Path, I thought... We could march in our spot, right? So let's, we're just gonna walk, so let's do that. Let's just walk in our, we're on this path, right? Now picture yourself walking up to gates. So we're gonna hold on to the gate handle and we get to that. So we're on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide. Open wide, open wide, it's all easy. But when we get to the next verse, so enter in, I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to give a big old, like this. So enter in, yes, and then the gates of holiness are open wide, okay? Easy. I wish I had extra arms. I always say that because I love doing actions. Just <laughs> Maybe I'll do one, up, one verse a cappella just so I can. Anyway, so let's start walking.
Nobody was taking screenshots while Nick was going around the church there. Those are going to haunt us forever. Oh, friends, a blessing as we get ready to go. And uh, before I offer it, just to remind folks, we're just going to take our time, right, going on out. So we're going to start at the back and move to the front, right, as people go out. Or we're going to start, right, Jen? Yes, I have that right. So you got to make sure I get it right. So the last pews forward, we'll just go row by row. Just take your time and allow people to go out single file there so we can keep distance. It's a gorgeous day. So we're going to make our way right out the wooden doors there at the church, go down to the crossing or hang out in the parking lot. You can take your mask off, breathe that fresh air, rub all that nice moisturizer that's now on your face, right? Get all that off, feel fresh and clean, and connect with your neighbors. So friends, a blessing as we get ready to go. And I'm left with this quote. I've been quoting Sarah Miles a lot. Um, She's well worth reading if you ever want to look her up. She has all kinds of great stuff online as well. And she says, something pretty provocative for me to consider these days. She said, faith, for me, isn't an argument, a criticism, or a philosophical proof. It is instead a lens, a way of experiencing life, and a willingness to act. So let us act together. Here is this blessing. May the faith that leads your steps from here guide you to be makers of the way. A life that is wider and deeper and so abundant, there is room for all. And may the Spirit embolden your heart to act on the good news of love and justice that is in you for the sake of all who are hungry and all who thirst. And all the people said, Amen. On this path.